here. Thank you, Abby Madeline, for inviting me and having me here. Um, tonight, my presentation is called Racist Policy and Resistance in Rochester. And it's something I didn't learn growing up. In fact, one of my fourth graders, when I first started teaching, uh, asked me when you do your kind of token Martin Luther King lesson, like your one time a year racism talk. Uh, and they were like, wait, did this happen here? Did Martin Luther King come to Rochester? And I, like, I had no idea. I didn't know that Dr. King had come here and stayed at Charles Lunsford's house uh, in 1958 and 62 to help organize against like redlining and police brutality in Rochester. And I was like, I'll look into it. You know, like that's what a good teacher is supposed to do. So I started digging in and learning this story of our community, realizing how my story had intersected, an uncomfortable story, but a story that I think is super important to us understanding the moment we're in, uh, this historic moment, contextualizing some of this moment. And so I started teaching my fourth graders and their questions were just, they were driving me to research more, to go down to the county clerk's office, go to the U of R library, uh, like start meeting people that I was reading about in these old newspaper clippings and learning their stories of leading the civil rights movement, both in the 50s, 30s and present. And then other teachers and people like at the U of R and I don't know, uh, other places would be like, hey, I never learned this. Will you come talk? I was like, oh, OK. So I just started sharing. And so now I've given this talk uh, several hundred times across the community and quite a few times to poor Madeline over here. I think you've heard it more than more than a few. So I'm going to try to get you with some some things you haven't seen before tonight to really try to spice this thing up. Um, but I am excited to talk and discuss, hear your questions afterwards. Um, please uh, share questions throughout in the chat. Um, and if Madeline, if you can spot those in the chat, and if there's something that comes up that you know I'm going to answer later, just hold it till the end. Um, but if there's something I've got to answer, please just interrupt me. I can't check the chat while I'm moving. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, and here we go. So if you look at the cover here, you'll see uh, the redlining map or racist policy that has shaped where people live in Rochester and who has access to wealth, health, and so many other pieces. And on the right, you'll see uh, an act of resistance, 1962, uh, a Black Lives Matter march. It wasn't called Black Lives Matter march, but it was a march and protest at City Hall against po police brutality something that has been very commonplace this summer at Rochester's City Hall. This march was to protest the brutal beating in police custody of a man named Rufus Farewell, who was uh, beaten in this red line neighborhood over here, and joined uh, the Reverend Gibson at Memorial AME, the church Frederick Douglass went to, uh, in leading this protest demanding justice. And some justice was achieved, um, but we're gonna talk about that story, about this legacy of people of color, who came together to fight back against these racist policies that we might follow in their lead, follow that legacy and continue um, the struggle for justice in our community. I'm also the co-lead of the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project with Kelly McNair and Keisha James and a group of teachers from across Monroe County who've been developing curriculum inquiry projects, not a lecture like this, but primary source-based inquiry uh, that helps kids understand the story and take action to create change. I wish we had the time to do this five-day lesson right now, but I'm gonna give you the abridged version in the form of a bit more of a lecture. Some of the sources you're gonna see are the near, uh, Richard Rothstein's Color of Law. Rothstein uh, is the guy for redlining, like the expert. He came to Rochester a few years ago and we got to be on a panel together and he spent a bunch of time going through the slides you're gonna look at tonight and giving a lot of insight into how to tell the national story of racist housing right here in Monroe County. We're gonna take a look at the DNC archives, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination from 1958. Uh, tons of interviews with people of color in the Voices Project. They were interviewed in 1980 and you can listen to their voices online. It's much better than listening to me, but some of them are like super long and really fun to listen to people talk about their cleaning routine. And then all of a sudden they drop like this crazy protest they led in the middle of this oral history. And it's incredible to check out. So I recommend Googling that. And then you'll also just see a bunch of interviews that I've had the chance to do with many of these folks who become friends and mentors that you'll see throughout the presentation. A little level set or definition to help us be thinking. I'm gonna use these terms racist and anti-racist throughout the presentation. I know Ibram Kendi recently came to U of R and uh, his work has been really influential on in me and challenging, especially this idea that there's a problem with the term not racist, something I would have called myself for most of my life. 
He says, not racist is a claim that signifies neutrality. I'm not a racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. There's no neutrality in the racism struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There's not an in-between or safe space of not racist. That claim of not racist, neutrality is a mask for racism. And for most of my life, I was that person who's like, I treat everyone the same. I don't see color. Um, and like Martin Luther King solved this problem. I'm sure there's moments of, you know, some bad people who are racist down South, but that doesn't really impact my story or my family. But as I dug into this research, as I intersected with and interacted with some of these folks who subscribed to these ideas, I started to realize this idea that if you're anti-racist, it's about actively pushing back to create systemic change. And if you're racist, it has to do with allowing racism to occur, being complicit in our silence or inaction, or forcefully trying to create these policies. And you're gonna see a little bit of both throughout this presentation. The thing is in our community, we have incredible racial disparity today. And when this area was created, uh, when people colonized it, uh, this land was formerly Seneca land, it was taken over. Um, and the people that took it over uh, were folks who enslaved Africans, brought them to this community, like Colonel Rochester and Penfield, who used enslaved labor right here in Monroe County. Towns like Henrietta and Gates, Mount Morris, also named for people that enslaved others. But of course, people of color fought back, they named the racism for what it was, came together with others in the community, the great Douglas, of course, Austin Stewart, who was enslaved in upstate New York, escaped to Rochester, opened a spot on the Underground Railroad underneath his business, the first Black-owned business in Rochester. It was a grocery store. And he also opened the first school. It was a segregated school for Black children because they weren't allowed to attend schools in Monroe County. Of course, we're the home of suffragists, activists like Susan B. Anthony and Hester Jeffries, who fought uh, for voting rights, a community of great innovation and solved huge problems when it comes to medicine, like uh, Dr. Whipple uh, or George Eastman, when it comes to the way we see the world. Both men who while have changed our world have also left some complicated legacies, as you're going to see in a minute. And if we're going to move forward in this community, we're going to have to come together again in that spirit of activism, of abolition. Um, and of innovation to solve these problems because the problems are significant. In 2020, ACT Rochester discovered that African-American kids in our region are more than four times as likely as white children to live in poverty. Both African-Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts. And this is directly linked to housing segregation. When you look at this map of our community, the city of Rochester is that green area and our suburbs are that blue area, each dot representing one individual, a blue dot representing a white person, green, black, orange, Hispanic, red, Asian. And you can see that our community is very much separated and separate um, and in many ways unequal. Our schools in New York state are the most segregated in the country and the most segregating school district border in all 50 states is the line dividing Rochester from Penfield, according to EdBuild in 2020. In our community, white privilege is literally life itself. Where a child from Pittsburgh's 14534 zip code born today will live up to nine years longer than a child from Rochester's 14608 zip code, that previously red line neighborhood of Rochester that we're gonna talk a lot about tonight. And part of these policies from the past we're gonna explore have helped create a wealth gap where white families have 10 times the wealth of black families or net worth uh, in 2016, and it only continues to expand. Unless we decide to live out what is the thesis of my talk and these brilliant words from the incredible James Baldwin, who says, not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I wanna invite all of you to join me tonight in facing head on the root causes of racial discrimination and injustice in our community, that we might name it, tell the truth about it, something we haven't often done in this community, understand it, dismantle it, and move forward to building a more just and equitable greater Rochester. And I wanna do this in the spirit of folks like Douglas and Stewart, and one of my personal heroes, Howard Coles. His daughter, Joan, is on the board of directors for our curriculum project and helped write the Voice newspaper with her dad, uh, who in 1938 published a massive study from his, uh, his uh, print shop right there on Clarissa Street, the red line 14608 zip code, calling out the red line that had begun in Rochester. The report found that realtors and banks wouldn't give loans to black people. The people of color were being forced into two neighborhoods, the third and seventh ward. 
that in those units, more than 30% of homes did not have running water. Coles got his real estate license. He pushed back. He helped organize fight. Uh, he helped organize the Urban League and the NAACP and just fought and fought for change in our community. Dr. Anthony Jordan in 1942 built on his research when it came to housing and connected it to health. Much like today, housing and health are directly connected. Jordan found in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes was 50% higher than that of whites. Tuberculosis death rate among people of color is two and one half times that of whites. This is 1942, but think about 2020 with COVID-19 with almost three times the rate of deaths for people of color compared to white folks. How far have we really come? And we know this is connected to housing and systemic racism, which was also called out by the great Dr. Lunsford. Dr. King stayed at his house when he came to Rochester. Lunsford fought hard against some of the institutions and individuals who were preventing health equity for all in our community, especially the University of Rochester whose president, as well as its medical school, refused to allow Black students to become nurses or physicians because they thought that if they did this, they would have to examine white women in obstetrics and that doing that would just be absolutely horrific. And in fact, Dean Whipple, the famous Nobel Prize winner who Whipple Park and Whipple Auditorium are named for, um, he proudly told the New York State Commission on the Urban Black Population that, oh, no, they, we can't have Black people observe white women in obstetrics. And this is written up in this whole report. But of course, people kept fighting back. And, and eventually in 1945, one African-American was accepted, Dr. Edwin Robinson, who wasn't allowed to do those obstetrics rounds. Um, and carried on this legacy of mentoring the few Black physicians that began to come through the medical center. There have only been about 87 African-American men who have graduated from the medical school here in the University of Rochester, at least until 2016, according to the Rochester Journal of Medicine. The first woman of color to graduate from the medical center as a physician was Dr. Ruby Bell in 1972. Meanwhile, Strong had a segregated and separate and unequal nursery up until the early 1960s. In fact, Dr. Walter Cooper and his wife, Helen Cooper, um, were here at Rochester. Dr. Cooper was the first PhD in chemistry of color at University of Rochester. He walked over from his chemistry classes uh, to visit his wife who had just given birth. And he, he writes in an interview, I go over to Strong and find my wife on a segregated ward. It was separate and unequal. As soon as my wife, Helen, and I returned home, we vowed never to use Strong Hospital again. And there's still significant mistrust for the University of Rochester Medical Center because of these kinds of practices. Um, and it, it's an important part of this story. Meanwhile, the people who worked in these laboratories as uh, workers, as uh, cleaners, uh, as healthcare aides like Maddie Best were also being discriminated against uh, with lesser pay, no benefits. They weren't allowed to become secretaries facing the front end because of their skin color. So Maddie Best and others organized the workers at the University of Rochester, um, and they led a, a formal sit-in in the president's office demanding that they be allowed to have their union recognized, the SAU-1199. Um, and after uh, hours of stalemate, the U of R notified them that the union would be acknowledged, winning one of the most important contracts that brought significant uh, economic justice for people of color and the other employees uh, who were at these lesser jobs, uh, according to the institution at the time. And that story is one that I think is incredibly important. When you think about the $15 increase to the minimum wage for workers at the University of Rochester, you got to remember Maddie Best is the person who began that fight back in 1973. Of course, the Reverend Body in Mount Olivet Church challenged in the DNC some of the racism going on in housing, saying that in Rochester, only two areas have been gracefully been available for people of color, saying if any attempt is made to move out of these black ghettos, the attempt is met with opposition. And tonight, we're gonna to dig deep into the specific systemic racism and opposition in the real estate industry, something called a racially restrictive covenant. We're gonna look at the 1934 National Housing Act and the redlining and VH and uh, VA and FHA mortgages that came out of it. We're gonna take a peek at urban renewal, uh, systemic racism and policing and education, and talk about how we might move forward as a community and what it might mean for you at U of R to be a part of this work. A note about the period of time we're going to cover. It's 1910 to 1970, the Great Migration. Rochester in 1910 had only 5,000 African-Americans, but by 1970, that number had exploded. 
Millions of African Americans fled the South during this period of time in search of better jobs, fleeing white domestic terrorism from the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and they came to places like Rochester, and they weren't allowed to work at companies like Kodak, uh, where Kodak had one black employee in 1939. Instead, they, they were hired to pick fruit uh, out in Rochester's suburbs and rural areas. They weren't allowed to live there, though, so they had to take the train back every night uh, to rent and stay in those two neighborhoods that Reverend Body mentioned, the third and seventh ward, which we'll dig deeply into. And one of the people who in the early 1900s, before this was codified by the National Housing Act, uh, was Frank Drum, who was part of the National Association of Real Estate Boards, who had a code of ethics that governed real estate agents nationwide and in Rochester, whose ethics specifically said you'll lose your license if you don't enforce this rule. It said a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property, occupancy, or members of any race or nationality or individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. Dr. Walter Cooper, after graduating from the U of R, he describes how he and his wife, they answered ads for 69 apartments in white neighborhoods and suburbs, and because of their skin color, were refused at all of them ended up subletting from a family of color in the redlined Beechwood neighborhood where I live. Dr. Alice Holloway Young, a good friend as well, um, incredible lady, she helped found MCC. She was the first black principal in all of Monroe County, just a pioneer for racial justice in our community. And when Dr. Young and her husband James tried to buy a house in the 19th Ward where a bunch were for sale, upper middle class family, not a single bank would pre-approve them for a mortgage and not a single real estate agent would show them a home in the neighborhoods they wanted to look. So she did what the 57 other African-Americans at the time did who were able to buy a house out of those red line neighborhoods. They found a wealthy white person at the NAACP usually, like Harper Sibley, who was her friend and the heiress of the Western Union Telegraph fortune, which was still quite a bit of money in the 1950s, who bought them a house sight unseen on Millbank Street in 1904, right across the river there from the U of R. The Youngs were really afraid to move into the neighborhood, even though they knew it was their right and something they were committed to doing, because they knew about the Klan presence in that neighborhood and what had happened to others who had tried. So they moved in in the middle of the night without a moving truck, just a few bags to try to stay safe and keep a low profile, ease into the neighborhood. But the next morning, they found in their mailbox this note from the Ku Klux Klan of Millbank Street that went on to threaten to burn their house down if they didn't leave. But the Youngs refused. And Alice has asked that when I share her story, I mentioned the white family on the street, the Bushes, who stood with them against the racist neighbors, against the Ku Klux Klan, and helped them live there for the next 17 years. And that the next time someone says, oh, that was just the time, we can't blame white people or our grandparents for these kinds of things, Alice has asked that you remember the Bush family across the street who knew what was right and stood with them. We don't think of Rochester, though, as a clan town. We think of that as Florida, Mississippi, but this is East Rochester, actually the high school football field uh, right there. Uh, 1926, 8,000 Klansmen burning three 50-foot high crosses uh, in celebration of white supremacy. So this was Monroe County, and cross burnings happened in our community in Black people's front yards up until the early 1980s, according to multiple articles uh, in the Democrat and Chronicle, in Henrietta, and Brighton, and Chilai, and Penfield. This was something that happened in Monroe County. The next thing I want to talk about uh, is something super sinister. It's called a racially restrictive covenant. These officially became outlawed in 1968. And these covenants, if any home built before 1950 or so, usually had one of these. In the summer, my students, myself, my friends at City Roots Land Trust, and uh, in a partnership with the Yale Law School's Environmental Protection Clinic, we took a deep and heavy dive into the microfilm at the county clerk's office where every deed to any home owned in our county is public. And on tens of thousands of deeds, we found racial covenants or rules saying that specifically, look at number five there, the dwelling shall be occupied by persons of the Caucasian race only. Legally enforceable rules on homes that the elites and leaders of Monroe County actively put on thousands of these homes. Meet County Manager Smith, one of the longest serving legislatures ever uh, in the country and the longest ever in Monroe County. He and the entire legislature voted that any county owned tax foreclosed properties would have these clauses put into their deeds, that no person of any race other than the Caucasian shall use or occupy these buildings. Let's take a look at Brighton. Kodak got together to carefully plan these 371 homes 
right across the street from Brighton High School. They were so carefully planned that when Kodak's Vice President Harry Haight formed the Realty Corporation to buy the land uh, and ESL Bank was founded to finance these mortgages, underneath every deed, beneath every home, explicitly said they should never be occupied by a Black person. And you can look at Kodak. They didn't just discriminate against hiring. This is almost 20 years after this housing was built. They get written up for have, by the state for having one Black employee out of 16,000, and that employee was a janitor. Bausch & Law and the other biggest firm in town had zero Black employees. So you can see the way white supremacy wasn't just something in housing. It was in employment. It was in healthcare. It was in educational institutions. And these racial covenants, though, they were all across our community. The Democrat and Chronicle advertised these covenants for desirable social character, meaning whiteness, like in the Council Rock neighborhood of Brighton. School districts like Thomas Edison School and Gates had these covenants barring black students from using the school. This is 1941. The Catholic Church, John Francis O'Hearn, agreed to the covenants in St. James Church in East Tarondacoit. Pittsburgh, all along the Oak Hill Country Club, Parenton, Fairport, and Fair Acres, East Rochester, over 2,000 homes in East Tarondacoit. Um, and one of these homes, uh, this is over by the lake and the zoo, was agreed to by the founder of Wegmans Food Markets, Walter Wegman, who agreed to this racist deed, didn't have to agree to it. And when he sold the home, after it expired, he made sure that racist deed stayed on the home so that the next white family would ensure that this home could not be sold to a person of color. You'll notice Forest Lawn and Webster, where Italian and Polish people were also excluded, all throughout Penfield, Greece. You'll see the head of the Builders Association, Norman Huck, the head of the Realtors Association, putting hundreds of these on homes and gates. Even the head of the Bar Association, Earl F. Case, putting these homes and signing these racist deeds into the deeds of the homes that he and his firms built. Take a look at the city of Rochester. My neighborhood in Beechwood used to be a baseball field. Uh, covenants on every home, North Winton, Browncroft neighborhoods, and the 19th War. And just like Howard Coles, just like Alice Young and Dr. Cooper, Judge Re Reuben Davis fought back, as people of color always have in our community. He describes how he fought back trying to buy a house over by Alice Young. He says, my wife and I were looking for a house in 1958. We saw one we liked at 135 Elmdorf Ave, just a block or so west of Genesee. I'd say there were probably four Black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee Street at that time, and the owner refused to sell to us because we were Black. There was a racially restrictive covenant on the deed that these houses, when built, were not to be sold to people of color or to Italians. Before I go on, Italians, Jewish, and Eastern European people were not legally white in our country, according to the FHA. But in 1944, with the passage of the GI Bill, they became legally Caucasian or white. Whereas African Americans who had served in World War II were still deemed as non white and not full citizens without access to home ownership and still subject to these kinds of covenants. There's his home. Knopf Nagel Realty was selling it, helping enforce this deed. He says, I was active in the NAACP. And so a white friend bought the house and transferred it to me. We had to go through those kinds of devious methods in order to find housing. It was pretty typical in the difficulty for getting decent, safe housing, even if you could afford it. He goes on to describe how almost none of the towns had people of color living in them at this time, is this was how effective these covenants and this redlining was. And take a look at the map that we created this summer um, that we're continuing to add to almost every week. New people are coming forward and letting us know about the deeds underneath their homes across the county. And students at U of R are working with Kristen Doty and they're researching at the clerk's office to build this map out so that eventually we'll find every neighborhood that has them. We estimate there'll be between 30 and 40,000 of these across the county, and you can see where these places are. Now, we're getting to the most important part of the presentation. This is the National Housing Act of 1934, which codifies racial covenants. It codifies the racial discrimination in the real estate industry. And this law was in part written by these real estate men, especially from Chicago. Now, it's the wake of the Great Depression. There's a housing crisis. FDR is president, not from Mississippi. FDR is from New York State, former governor. Um, and he signs this law in, 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 in signs this bill into law. And what it does is it gives out over $119 billion in federal mortgage insurance or subsidies to families like mine to buy and build homes. Uh, it helps build highways. It does all these things 
the 30-year FHA mortgage, the low interest rate, and eventually the VA and GI Bill takes this on and takes that into all the loans that they're giving for veterans. And these loans were only for white people. And, excuse me, it, deter it, it helped segregate communities across the country. Right in the law, I read that if a neighborhood's to retain stability, its necessary properties continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. Going on to mandate racial deed restrictions, prohibiting the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they're intended, should be put into all new tracks if they're going to receive any kind of federally subsidized uh, mortgages or loans to be able to build those developments. Take a look, even highways. They should be used to separate inharmonious racial groups. And this is how we get 490 built in the inner loop right here in Monroe County. And for me, when I first learned this, I had some cognitive dissonance, right? FDR had been taught to me kind of as a hero, got us out of the depression, won World War II, right? Those kinds of things like, but then he also passes one of the most racist laws since slavery in our country's history. Even Kennedy gives us some language to think about this. He says, time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas to justify the racist policies of their era. Put another way, and so you want to talk about race, the author writes, the goal of racism is the profit and comfort of the white race, specifically rich white men, which I'd be remiss to not admit that that is me, that's my father, and both of my grandfathers, and our wealth came from my grandfathers, who in the 50s and 60s received FHA and VA loans subsidized by the government, government handouts that allowed them to buy homes in the suburbs, and to build incredible wealth from those homes and that equity, to use that equity to send my parents to college, to help send me to college. When, like a real bum, I crashed my car in my like, first month of being a teacher. I had no money in the bank. I went through a stop sign like a jerk. It, like the dumbest thing, right? And this mistake was like a $3,000 accident of having to repair my car. And I didn't have the money to afford it. And of course, the next day there's a check in the mail to help me fix this car, right? And my stupid mistake becomes a stupid mistake. Whereas for someone without the benefit of generational and family wealth, it becomes a tragedy. It becomes a real dilemma for how you get to work. Whereas because of the generational wealth my family had, which is tied to home ownership and housing, which is tied to this racist law, I was able to continue on and be a teacher for the last 10 years. Now, one of the ways this racist policy was enforced was through something called redlining or residential security maps that the Homeowners Loan Corporation was tasked by the FHA to create across the entire country. You can go online and dig into these maps and look at every city. You can go street by street, block by block, and see what the real estate agents who were hired to assess these neighborhoods said about the neighborhoods. Excuse me. And the neighborhoods were rated based specifically, and most importantly, about race and class. Areas were rated green and blue, best or desirable, uh, based on their being 100% um, white, middle and upper middle class. Yellow meant maybe a little poor neighborhoods, older homes. Redlined meant hazardous. If any uh, Jewish, Italian, or most importantly, black people lived in that neighborhood, no federal investment would go into that neighborhood. It was deemed hazardous, unsafe for investment. Um, those would be the neighborhoods first to be destroyed or for highways to go through and where African-Americans would be steered. Notice the neighborhood was 75% black, largely because of what the real estate industry had already been doing, 10% foreign. Um, so it got that hazardous red rating. Pittsburgh's East Avenue Estates by Oak Hill Country Club, 0% black, 0% foreign, quadruple the income. Notice businessmen uh, is seen as a plus. Therefore, it's given the blue line rating. If you're white, you get a 30-year mortgage to buy a home. And today, those homes are worth hundreds, thousands of dollars. Think about that wealth that's been generated. My neighborhood, Beechwood, 2% uh, Black, 30% foreign, hazardous. Meadowbrook, built by Kodak, with the covenants in every home, 0% Black, best, green-lined. All the suburbs, though, which originally were pretty small little villages and towns, didn't even qualify because they weren't big enough to get put on the big redlining map. They were given green line ratings. Um, and this policy was so effective. The most integrated suburb of Rochester in 1960 was Henrietta with 11 individual people of color led by uh, leader of the NAACP, Dr. Cooper, his wife, Helen, um, and a number of their friends who decided not to move to Henrietta because they wanted to live there, but because the whites there were the least organized is what Dr. Cooper said. So they moved in in solidarity and refused to leave. 
But housing at U of R was also segregated. Uh, fraternities like Sigma Chi actually had clauses in their bylaws, prohibited black people from joining and living in their homes. Richard Rothstein uses some more national scope and scale, saying the FHA and VA insured half of all new mortgages nationwide during this period of time, giving out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance to over 35 million families who benefited from these loans and built generational wealth, 98% of them being white. And you got to ask, we learned about Susan B. Anthony, Austin Stewart, Frederick Douglass, like this community of like anti-racism, of, uh, of fighting for justice, of activism. This must have been something, right, that the government did to us, not something that we wanted maybe in Rochester. But actually, what was going on in our culture, in almost all of our educational institutions, our town halls, our rotary clubs, was something called a blackface minstrel show. And these images are pretty upsetting to look at. A blackface minstrel show is when you have some main characters called N-men who blacken their faces, incredibly racist. They have the same names usually. You have a Jim Crow, a Zip C-O-O-M character. You have a Jim Dandy uh, character, a Mr. Sambo, an old black Joe, and they dance and sing, mock the intelligence of people of color, and just preach a message of hate, contempt, and a clear statement on who is welcome in these white neighborhoods, enclaves, and schools. And remember, this is 1960, front page of the Honeyway Falls Times. Remember, Henrietta is the most integrated suburb with only 11 Black people living in that town. Kodak led the way with these things. So did GM. Executives would dress up in blackface. They proudly published these photos in their magazine and newspaper. The Jewish Youth Association, the Lindhurst Theater, almost every school in RCSD having these shows. And look at what the Democrat and Chronicle published in the paper. Like, this was something to be proud of in Monroe County. Private schools like Aquinas, Brighton High School's Licorice Lights, Allendale and Pittsburgh partnered with U of R and the Memorial Art Gallery to put on their blackface shows each year. Newark, Pittsburgh's Catholic Parish having their annual blackface show at the town hall. RIT having their annual blackface show with their sororities and fraternities. And almost every town in our community publishing, publicizing, or having write-ups in the newspaper almost every year up until 1968, uh, documenting these horrific shows. But just like with Covenants, um, just like with moving into Henrietta, with Dr. Cooper, just like with Alice Young in the 19th Ward, or Howard Coles in his paper, people spoke up and fought back. The Reverend Primo of the NAACP and Flora Harris sent letters to all these schools doing these shows, even letters to the paper. This one letter really gets at what's going on, saying these blackface shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, public buildings. To do otherwise, they say, will cripple permanently the attitudes of white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all the dark skinned people of the world. Think of how many people in 1960 who are kids in blackface in these shows, explicitly taught this by their school, by their church, by their parents, are running so many of our institutions in Monroe County today. And this is what they learned growing up. In 1958, because of the efforts of activists of color, New York State starts to respond. But instead of action, they give us another commission, another report. And this was from 1958 on housing discrimination. Governor Harriman commissioned it. And while it didn't help folks too much at the time, it gives us a ton of specifics about how these racist policies directly impacted our community, especially in regard to stats. In 1950, the report found that 80% of all Black folks lived in just two neighborhoods of Rochester, the redlined Third Ward, right across the river from uh, the U of R, and the Seventh Ward. More than 1,600 units having no bathrooms, shared bathrooms, or more than 2,000 units, one person living in each room, until people like Connie Mitchell started to stand up. Connie Mitchell ran for office and eventually became the first woman and woman of color and person of color to be elected to any public office in Monroe County, saying she ran to fight these redlining policies, saying we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house in Greg Street, the agent told us, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson. They're not open to blacks. So we were confined from Jefferson back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city in that red line neighborhood. 30% of all units the report found did not have running water. If you've been listening super close, you remember Howard Coles at the beginning, 20 years prior, had shared that same stat and found no change. Meanwhile, people of color with a little bit more means 
uh, decided they were going to start challenging this more and more, this redlining. So in 1964, Dr. Thomas and Irina Bias bought a house in Irondequoit. After moving in, they had rocks and bricks and violence done to their home, their windows smashed in, threats, so they sold the home and joined the Coopers and Lees and Henrietta. But their story wasn't uncommon across Monroe County. People like Dick Ricketts, star of Rochester's NBA team, the Royals, it took him 16 months to find an apartment despite his wealth and his star status. The Tullivers, an engineer at Xerox, 1960, couldn't buy a house in Brighton, almost done with the paperwork to buy this home when his white neighbors successfully pooled their money and bought the house out from under him. Tulliver and the NAACP sued and won the right uh, to get back in that home. And you'll notice he invented these crazy glasses for people who don't have peripheral vision. Uh, and my fourth graders, they just love that picture. Of, if you notice it, it's just kind of cool. Uh, and they lived in that home for the rest of their lives. The Stubbs is in Greece. Uh, Ellen Stubbs and her husband, they started to get smart about what was going on. And uh, they started playing this game called checkers that was getting popular, where you have a white person of similar economic status go on the same day as you to look at a home in a neighborhood. So they targeted this neighborhood on Long Pond Road in Greece. Uh, the white family was shown multiple homes that were all for sale. The Stubbs got there and somehow no homes were for sale. Everything was completely sold out and nothing was available. The Stubbs took that information from themselves and their friends. They successfully sued and became one of the first African-American families to own a home in the town of Greece, a place where several years prior, my grandfather had bought a house and use the wealth from that house to send my mom to college. You know, and so think about these, these kinds of stories and think about your own story and how it connects to some of this, right? So think about 1958, they go on a little farther saying that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to any African-American in any suburb of Monroe County, not a single one. And during this period of time, the population of our suburbs was exploding, bringing generational wealth through home ownership to thousands and thousands of white families like mine. Now, with all this disinvestment caused by redlining in downtown Rochester or the inner city, these redlined neighborhoods, there began to be some significant issues. And instead of anti-racist policy change, uh, the government passes this law around urban renewal, giving Rochester over $35 million to decimate or raise black neighborhoods and to construct highways through them, and then minor amounts of some affordable housing for folks to live in. Um, this whites only commission led by Elmer Milliman of Central Trust Bank and John Dale, um, they, they oversaw the removal and displacement of 886 families from the seventh ward and 850 families from the third ward. This devastated these neighborhoods where despite the racial segregation and disinvestment, African-American communities had built churches, jazz clubs like Shep's Paradise and the Pithon and Carissa Street, the Stevens Grocery Store, all decimated by this incredibly racist policy that groups like Fight and Howard Coles at The Voice referred to as black folk removal, not that very nice term urban renewal. But when you have thousands of people getting pushed out of their homes, most of them being black folks that can't move to the suburbs or those green line neighborhoods of the city, where do they go? They go to streets like Jefferson Avenue where white families cashing in on the opportunity would subdivide their homes, single family homes into five family apartments where everyone would be sharing a bathroom and a kitchen leading to awful health conditions and all kinds of other issues. And so again, the government's like, we gotta do something, we gotta step in. Do we fund anti-racist policies and housing justice, or do we fund the police? And much like today, Rochester chose to fund the police, to increase the numbers of police and to enact a policy of containment that lives to this day, heavily policing these red nine neighborhoods um, and causing all kinds of friction with white cops from the suburbs coming in and policing these predominantly black neighborhoods. One of those streets was Jefferson Avenue. Um, Plymouth and Exchange, uh, th these kinds of streets where these problems are continuing to happen today. Daniel Prude was killed in police custody on Jefferson Avenue, one of those streets that was deeply impacted by redlining in these policies. There's Rufus Farrell on the right. He's sitting in a wheelchair because he was brutally beaten in police custody for the crime of attempting to lock up the gas station that he actually managed in this red line neighborhood. And because of his skin color, they couldn't believe that this could be his gas station. And on the left is the protest that he and the Reverend Gibson led demanding justice for what had happened. And he did receive a big payout. Um, 
and opened a couple of gas stations from that effort. Um, but also his story helped propel the Police Accountability Board. Dr. Kenneth Woodward, the father of community health in Rochester, he ran clinics at Baden Street, but he knew that health was also connected to public safety and accountability for the police. And so he joined the Police Accountability Board in 1963 to try to curtail the violence that was happening in these communities. Sadly, after a year after this, this uh, PAB was put into practice, they were completely stripped of their funding the next year and then eventually dissolved. Um, and today we have brought back that PAB in Rochester and the PAB, um, it's incredible. 75% of Rochesterians voted for this or voting Rochesterians voted for it. And right now uh, they're in court trying to get the right to discipline officers and hold them accountable. They do have subpoena power and the, policy, the power to suggest policy, but the PAB needs our support. And I really encourage you to listen to an interview the PAB did yesterday on uh, 1370 Connections with Evan Dawson, where they talk about some of the crazy events that are just so common and have been going on in Rochester since decades ago, as you're seeing in these same red line neighborhoods. And they're talking about some incredible solutions, including the need for the PAB to be fully funded, which right now it is not. And it's at risk of meeting that same fate of what happened in 63 if we don't come together as community members in Monroe County, especially as people in Rochester demand that this stay and be a tool that truly can be one of the pieces in creating systemic change in public safety. Now, in almost every red line city in the country in the 1960s, and in every red line neighborhood, people of color rose up in protest, especially in uprisings, rebellions, or what some have called riots. And in 1964, we had one. A thousand people were arrested, over, it lasted over three days, 1,500 National Guard troops were called out to quell the protest and the violence, mostly directed at white landlords. Um, and it, it was incredible. You've got to watch this documentary called July 64. I'll share a link. I think I already did share a link. It's in that, the slides or documents that I shared. It's about 50 minutes. And many of the folks that I've mentioned are interviewed in it describing what happened. Um, and you can see that direct connection between redlining, which our county historian actually said was directly linked to displacement from urban renewal, a lack of running water and police brutality. She went through all the arrest records and census data and found a direct connection to people who were lacking these things as being the ones that rose up in the streets and smashed the windows of those white landlords and businesses. But because this was in every city across the country, pretty much, in 1968, Lyndon Johnson, after Dr. King's assassination, had the impetus because of these protests to pass the Fair Housing Act for the first time giving African-Americans full citizenship rights through home ownership, ending redlining, ending racially restrictive covenants, um, and um, allowing access to the American dream. But in some ways, it was several decades too late. These suburbs were now too expensive for people to live in and were no longer subsidized the way they had been back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and early 60s. Um, it put the onus on discrimination on individuals like the Stubbses to sue for the right to live in their home, making it really difficult for your average person to be able to fight back against this injustice. And then HUD, or Housing and Urban Development, was the only agency tasked with enforcing this law by removing funding from communities that were failing to affirmatively further fair housing, which wasn't clearly defined and could have been anything. Nicole Hannah-Jones has actually found that this law has been enforced twice where funding has been taken away, at least until Barack Obama from President Nixon. Nixon actually ordered Secretary Romney to cease and desist from enforcing this law and fired him when he spoke back against it. Nixon justified this betrayal of the law by saying, I'm convinced legal segregation is wrong, but forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. Something that you'll hear a lot of folks in Rochester suburbs saying today. He says, I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live for the most part in black neighborhoods and there'd be predominantly black schools like RCSD and predominantly white schools like the one I grew up in in Webster. And this also connects to what was happening in education nationally and right here. Most of you have seen this famous picture of Elizabeth Eckford, the Little Rock Nine, 1957. She's facing down this angry white mob of racist white parents who are trying to prevent her from her right to an equal and integrated education. But look at Rochester. Over 10 years later, 
a similar angry mob of white parents protesting against black students who are integrating the school at Charlotte High School, hurling rocks, and stones, and racial epithets at the students as they try to attend school. These same parents and thousands of others led protests for years across Monroe County, trying to prevent school integration. At Marshall High School, 150 students and parents carrying signs that said, Black people go home, keep Marshall clean. Um, James Beard, um, a leader of color, started the Black Student Union at Charlotte High School. He says, I'm going to school, we're on the bus, and as soon as we get to the graveyard in Lake Ave, they, mean the white parents, would be hiding behind the wall. They come out from behind it throwing bricks, rocks, iron, anything they could, busting windows, and people would be screaming. Uh, dolls and blackface would be hung from the trees outside of the school. And yet you could see these students who came together and organized. This is actually the yearbook picture from the club uh, who literally would have patrols in the hallways to walk students who were more vulnerable to class. Monroe County, the next year, the school district abandoned that integration plan and Monroe County suburbs were protected by Milliken versus Bradley from the influence uh, of people of color from being able to move in or being integrated across district lines. And we've got a community today it is one of the most segregated in the country. For that redlining, you can see clearly displayed in our census data on the right. You can see the way wealth has continued to be hoarded in our suburbs, that wealth that was created not just through hard work, but through federal subsidies to families like mine, and poverty concentrated in the city. That same pattern is true for owner occupancy, social vulnerability, uh, food insecurity, asthma, insurance, mental health, high blood pressure, all of these things in those same neighborhoods that were designed that way. In fact, a recent report from just this year from the National Community and Reinvestment Coalition found residents in redline neighborhoods of Rochester are expected to live five years shorter than those in neighborhoods coded green. Nationally today, white families have 10 times the wealth of black families. It's gonna take black families 228 years to earn back the same amount of wealth that white families have today. Unless we heed the words of the great Baldwin, who says that not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I just hope you've joined me tonight in facing racist policy and the code of ethics in the real estate industry, like Howard Coles did when he got his license and stared down those agents who eventually forced him out of the real estate industry. And I think I forgot to mention his story at the beginning. He fought back against that Frank Drum guy he showed some people homes in these neighborhoods and he got forced out. Or Judge Davis with racial covenants, buying that house in the 19th Ward, breaking those laws. We Connie Mitchell and Cooper and Alice Young and the Stubbses fought redlining in the courts through moving, through using their bodies, through organizing, moving, excuse me, in solidarity. The urban renewal and racism and policing was fought by the thousands protesting in the street in 1964 and today. And the way education, uh, was fought back against uh, the racism in education by people like James Beard and his friends, the Black Student Union, um, and people today who are continuing to demand a fair and equal integrated education that is not happening in our county. And some of the most vocal advocates, and the reason why I do this work, are kids who, when they hear this story, like these three girls in my fourth grade classroom, who several years ago heard these stories, understood this history, and turn the lens on their school where they realized there was racism in Henrietta. We had no black teachers in the school. Um, and the girls said, this is wrong, we have to change it. So they researched, they found we had 11 black teachers out of 550 white teachers. And they, they found the chances of them graduating with a teacher who looked like them was almost impossible. So they organized, they met with the principal, they made their demands and research clear. They met with the assistant superintendents, their research was shared with the school board. And recently, our district changed its hiring policy. They're actively recruiting teachers of color, going down south to historically Black universities to recruit and retain and change hiring policies so that these girls have the teacher that they deserve. And if a group of nine-year-olds can organize together and demand changing and impact the hiring policies of a huge school district, imagine what other nine-year-olds could do or eighth graders, or 12th graders, or imagine students at the University of Rochester, or teachers or members of our community, if armed with the legacy and example of those who have come before us, carry that forward and the wisdom of our elders forward, imagine the justice and the change that we might do if we continue to not let the story go unheard 
and continue to take action. Some of the most important pieces I think have to do with housing, specifically in suburban comprehensive plans and city comprehensive plans around zoning and access to affordable housing. It's truly affordable, below 50 or even 30% of the area median income. Supporting organizations like City Roots Land Trust who are fighting gentrification in Beechwood and the gentrification that's being caused by the U of R in the Plymouth Exchange neighborhood. Advocating uh, for uh, tenant rights. We have almost 9,000 evictions a year in Monroe County. We need to support groups like the Citywide Tenant Union who every day are helping organize tenants to fight back against unjust landlords. We can subsidize loans in red line neighborhoods. We can change zoning policies to allow ADUs, reparations. I think there are thousands of other things that we can do and have to do. And we've got to come together. We've got to carry this legacy forward. And that's why it's worth it to me to share this story with you tonight. And I can't wait to hear your thoughts, uh, your reactions, your questions, your comments and pushback. And so uh, I'll share in the chat again, a link to those slides if you're interested in digging in uh, and a few other resources that I've compiled that you'll see in the, in the talk. Um, and I would uh, love to hear any thoughts, any questions uh, or comments that folks have. Feel free to throw them in the chat or unmute and share them out loud. Hi, so um, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this talk. It was really fascinating to learn all this stuff. So um, I grew up in Pittsburgh and it was the education there is really lacking, especially in this area. So it was like really valuable to finally get this information. Um, um, also on a similar note right now, there are still like debates happening about um, getting more low income housing in the town. And so there are people who are trying to build more low income housing. And there's unfortunately a really strong pushback right now from people who say like property values are going to decline and similar similar like phrases, I guess. So what um, the mayor's saying, yeah. Yeah. I recommend uh, getting in touch with Kevin Beckford, who's on the town board. He's doing some really great work. He's on the advisory board for our curriculum project. He's a good friend and he's asked, he's also at U of R. Um, and he's fighting hard to make these changes in the town. But the, the resistance has been significant. Um, same with the, the school district. Um, and I think continue to encourage them to make sure this history gets taught. It's gonna be super important. Um, and taking a look that actually it's untrue that if affordable housing gets built in a suburban town like Pittsburgh, it increases diversity. More kids are able to move into a town like Pittsburgh that already struggles to have enough kids to fill up schools and pay the school bills because when you have R1 zoning across your entire town, it makes it incredibly difficult for young families to move in and send their kids to those schools. So things like that are incredibly important. Um, and also all kinds of research shows that the more diverse and integrated community is, property values go up. Um, and those kinds of things are absolutely true and important. And following people of color like Kevin who are doing this good work, I think really worth getting in touch with. Um, and learning more and supporting it. And he's faced terrifying stuff, threats, people come into his house, terrifying letters. I mean, it's, it's significant and there's trauma there and recognizing that and speaking out against it, naming it for what it is. Uh, when some of those comments about social engineering are being made at the town board meetings to be like, no, our town was socially engineered. Kevin always talks about those covenants we found at the clerk's office that are all throughout Pittsburgh. Like, Pittsburgh was designed to be whites only by redlining and the real estate developers who put those deeds in. I think that's a key piece. And I appreciate you sharing your story and making that connection. And uh, Kevin should be have a UR email address. And I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Sean, I want to thank you. Shane, I want to thank you very much for your work on redlining and helping to reveal some of the patterns that have affected Rochester and is shaping Rochester. One of the areas that uh, we're trying to address in these the uh, um, areas that have uh, very poor housing is the concept of tiny home villages. And along the Plex area there, uh, there are plans to have um, affordable housing there. And we would hope that perhaps tiny homes could be among those uh, considerations there. Uh, tiny homes in Rochester is being um, promoted by a group called REACH, um, Rochester is engaged for the uh, uh, chronically homeless. Our effort is not just for homeless persons, but to, to increase 
diversity of affordable housing. In Rochester, we tend to have very expensive brick type buildings, whereas the tiny home being a wooden structure primarily, it also affords a chance for workforce development. So the group called REACH is currently working to get city codes changed to make it possible for tiny homes um, and also to have a workforce development as part of this project. So keep an eye on the group called REACH and its efforts to develop affordable housing. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, John. I think REACH is doing some great work. At City Roots Land Trust, we partnered with REACH uh, to help uh, potentially have, make sure that land is permanently affordable and community controlled. And I know our, uh, our ED, Joe DeFiore, has been talking a bunch with you guys. And Peter Peters has been really involved with the Housing Justice Alliance and super grateful for that good work. I think that's definitely an important piece of the puzzle. Thank you for sharing that, John. What else are people thinking? Hi, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Um, first of all, just wow. I was to, to come to this event by some members in a group of my and a group that I'm in, and they had nothing but positive things to say and just they were floored and they say we've gone several times and we want to continue to keep going. And so I they this lived up to it a hundred percent. Um oh, a little right. background. I'm a Rochester native. I grew up in Caledonia, which is on the outskirts of Rochester, but very rural, very suburban, very white. And then I came to Rochester for uh, college, but I was resonating just in stories that my grandparents have told me about their experience growing up in SOTUS. And you said people migrated up here and they, they picked fruit. My grandpa's told me tons of stories about how he moved up here to Rochester and picked apples for the longest. Yeah. And then the majority of my family members worked at Kodak and they told me they have stories of how, how few people of color started at Kodak. And then over time there, it started to grow and it just, and then at the very end of your presentation, you talked about the group that you work with. And I am first cousins with Radia Bridges. I had no idea. Radia, that, you know Radia? Radia is like one of my, my favorite girl. people in the world. Oh. Yeah, it's, I'm just like connecting to each part of your presentation. I'm so glad that I came and I, my question in the back of my mind the whole time was like, what, okay, I'm ready. Like, what do we do? What's next? And you listed so many things that we could do to take action and I'm on board hundred percent, but I feel like I'm still significantly lacking in education. Like this was just an hour and it, ooh, it wasn't enough to really get me fully educated to where I feel like I can make a difference. So would it be the books that you presented about? Like, where can I go to learn more about this? The first and best place to look is Howard Coles. I just shared a bunch of uh, uh, of his newspapers that I've done a little bit of personal digitizing of uh, from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Howard Coles was actually from, I think it was Caledonia. He was part of the Culpepper clan. Who, okay, yeah. uh, are you familiar with that? Yeah, Culpepper is a church that's connected deeply with mine in Rochester. There it is. I mean, that's that's Howard Coles, and then makes his way to Rochester, and he opens his newspaper, and you can read the newspaper. He'll talk about the Culpepper uh, story, and he'll talk about the migrant camps and the fruit pickings. If you look at the link I just shared, you'll see a bunch of articles where he goes like to the camps and investigates wow. and does like muckraking about the fruit picking, and like it, I would love to like hear what your grandfather says about like yeah. his articles and like, like, did he get it right? You know, uh, some of that stuff is fascinating to look at, but I also recommend the books on that sheet that I shared. Richard Rothstein's Color of Law is a must read, but even more important is Kianga Yamada Taylor's Race for Profit, which talks about what happened after redlining ends in 1968 and predatory inclusion became the word of the day for banks cashing in on these FHA loans selling homes to people that they knew couldn't afford it um, in these neighborhoods where the property values plummeted because of the disinvestment. Um, so that kind of thing. Uh, and then the way like public housing has been privatized. White people got public housing in Rochester. They got Fernwood, they got Ramona Heights, they got Seth Green, Cobbs Hill Apartments. And then people of color 20 years later get public housing at the Hanover houses. And they didn't keep the public housing up. The city didn't fund it. They put it in a red line neighborhood instead of the larger, open, more park-friendly neighborhood that it was supposed to go in, but white people rioted and prevented it from going into that neighborhood over by Ben Franklin High School. And then Councilman Nagel pushed it back into the seventh ward. You know, and it's like, and then 20 years later, 30 years later, they blew up the towers because like there was no funding to keep them up. 
like they had grass for like one year and they were like, sorry, we can't afford to keep the grass here. You know, and like these kinds of stories start happening. And then, but then so many white families in Rochester, they lived in Hanover houses or Chatham Gardens or Fernwood Heights or Ramona Park. And they used that federally subsidized housing to save some money and then get that down payment on their FHA or VA loan. So all these like working class or poor folks have access to the middle class and the American dream. And then all of a sudden these laws change and it's like, oh, actually now we're going to pull up like a bunch of these benefits away from it. And just sort of like no one has benefit. So then poor white folks at the time were also hurt by some of those changes. And that's where I would also recommend uh, a book I just started. Heather McGee is her name. And the book is called The Sum, uh, the Sum of Us. And uh, it just came out. She's an amazing person. I'll type the name in the chat. I'm going to put it on the link. If you just check if you check out a bunch of the newspapers, they talk about it. But she talks about the way a lot of this stuff happened, and then how we can talk about this better and tell the story in a way that shows white people as well that like you are not benefiting anymore from the racism the way you might have mm -hmm. in the past, or the benefits from racism because. I still benefit from racism whenever I walk into a job interview, whenever I go to funders to look for funding for a project I'm working on at City Roots, there's no way it doesn't help. Like the people there are mostly white, you know, and you're like, it, it is absolutely a part of the story, but learning how to navigate that, figure out what kind of action you want to take, what kind of activist you want to be. There's so many different people to model yourself after and learn from. And so the most important thing, aside from the books and the reading, thanks, Christina, I think is it's finding people of color in our community, people like your grandfather, but meeting others who are activists and active now um, to connect with and hear their stories, ask them what this was like, how, what worked for them, what didn't work. Like it's been powerful for me to talk to Dr. Cooper or Dr. Young or Howard Coles' daughter, Joan, and hear their stories and the things that were just terrible and didn't work when they fought back. And then the things that like were their victories and, and how and why that is so, so I think important. And then finding people to be a part of that struggle with you, picking some of those things to fight back against, screw it up and keep going. I feel like that's a common thing that continues to happen in this kind of work, but that not giving up that hope and keep going, arm yourself with the knowledge from those books and the people. And I don't know, keep doing it. Crush your studies at U of R and you know what I mean? Like all that stuff keep going. So that's awesome, Olivia. And if, if you do take a look at some of those articles, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So definitely shoot me an email. It's, it's linked in the, in the form. And I can't wait to tell Radia that I, I saw you. I'm seeing yeah, her. Yeah, next we'll week. Awesome. Thank you. yeah, you got it. Anybody else have some thoughts or questions? Um, yeah, I'm from the same group as Olivia. And I just want to say that like, that was so informative yet touching, and it was just really great. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Emily. It was really nice to hear. Well, Shane, I don't want to keep you here too, too late. Um, this was absolutely fabulous. I have heard this talk, I don't even know how many times, and I always learn something new. Um, so thank you for being the best. Um, for all of the students here, um, this was a Wilson workshop as part of Wilson Days of Engagement. So I am dropping a link in the chat, and if you fill it out, we will send you a $10 gift card to Adis Baba. It's Ethiopian food. Um, so yeah, fill that out so that we can mail you your gift card. Um, our next workshop is on March 24th. That's two Wednesdays from now um, at 6.30 p.m. on the 19th Ward and Plex. So if you enjoyed this, maybe consider coming to that one as well. Is um, Dorian Hall speaking at that one? He is. Oh, you got to come to that. Dorian's my friend. He's on the board of the Land Trust with me. He's got a lot to say. You'll enjoy it. And his mom, she's like a civil rights legend. Is Dorothy coming too? I don't think so. But... Oh, well, he'll tell some good stories still. And he, he's his own legend. Sorry, I, gotta, I had to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm putting a second link in the chat, which is um, for if you are a first year student and you want credit for Wilson Days of Engagement, fill out that form um, so that we can make sure we get you your t-shirt at the end of the year. Um, I think that's everything for now. Thank you everyone so, so, so much for being here. Thank you, Shane. Um, this was wonderful. And if you have any friends who you want to hear this information, um, the YouTube video like recording of this will be posted in 
maybe a week or two. I just need time to do all of the captioning for it. <laughs> Have a great Thank you guys night, so everybody. much. Thanks for having me, Madeline and Abby. Have a great night. Great to meet you, Olivia. Great to meet you, John. Thank you. Bye, Bree. Thanks for having me. Olivia, really quick. What group are you a part of? Uh, APO, Alpha Phi Omega. Nice. Oh, Very nice. Good. Just curious. Awesome. <laughs> Olivia, what was your last name again? Brumfield. Brumfield, okay. All right, I'm texting Radia right now. Have a I good just, night. See, I'm the other day. Oh, you just told her. Oh, okay. Have a good one. Thanks. First one. Woohoo. <laughs> it went well. I mean, it was all Shane because he's amazing, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Cool. Um, is there anything that I can do to help you after this one? I don't think so. I'm working with Lauren on the one that's in two weeks. I have a lot of work I need to do on that one. Um, and then the two that are in May are both about community engagement. So me and Andrew are just going to do those together. So. Okay. Cool. Well, good luck. Thank you. Let me know if there is anything, have a good night. You too. Bye. Good to see you.